Yay. All right. Um, so with that, uh, my name is James O'Keefe. I'm captain of the Massachusetts Pirate Party. I'm joined today by uh, Eli, Joe, and Steve. How are the three of you? Doing all right. I am splendiferous. Wonderful. So uh, with that, um, uh, some updates on, on our part. Uh, we've been helping Joe, uh, who's running for 17th Middlesex State Representative to get on the ballot. We'll have an update later. Um, we have two more opportunities to gather signatures that we're planning. Uh, or Joe's campaign is planning. Uh, one is a, this upcoming Sunday, a week from today, 10 to 2, and there'll be, an, so that'll be the 21st, and there'll be another one on the 28th, also Sunday, 10 to 2. So uh, Joe's campaign is roaring along, uh, getting signatures, but we'd like to turn out some folks uh, so that hopefully we can get this all wrapped up uh, next Sunday. So if that's something that you want to help with, there'll be a link in the description below, uh, or you can check myspirates.org and uh, there'll be information there as well. So uh, in terms of other events that are coming up, we'll be at the Boxborough Pfeiffer's Festival in um, June, um, June 18th. I want to say. Uh, so we'll have a table at that if that's something that you want to participate in. By all means, uh, we'd love to have you. We'll have a sign up form uh, up in the next few days or so. Um, uh, also, the uh, Trans Resistance March is usually in June. So um, hopefully there's no overlap there and uh, we'll be at that. Um, additionally, so, well, well, we'll, we can get into, uh, that in a moment. The other thing I'm going to mention, the other events I'm going to mention, uh, as part of the discussion, but just as a reminder, if you want to run as a candidate for federal office, uh, you still can as a pirate. Um, you have until late June, uh, anyways, June, July to get all your signatures in and need to get 2000. So if that's something that you're interested in, by all means, contact us info at masspirates.org and, uh, we'll be happy to help you out with that. So with that, Steve, you had an update from my hometown of Somerville. Yeah, it's your hometown, my former hometown. Um, I don't live in Somerville, but I'm close enough that I could see it. In fact, I'm uh, watching what look, appears to be some sort of a sporting event at the Dillboy Athletic Complex as we speak. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, this news involves uh, a device called ShotSpotter or a company called ShotSpotter. But anyway, these are devices. They're sort of like microphones that are put on buildings and telephone poles and the idea is that they can detect when a uh, a firearm is fire, fired hence the name shot spotter and you know based on having a couple of them up uh, they can kind of triangulate the position and alert police so that police officers can be on the scene quickly so seems like a seems like a, on paper it seems like a, a good idea but you know these um, you know, as these devices have been around for a while, uh, we're starting to realize their shortcomings. And Somerville, in particular, is um, you know they use shot spotter technology, and they are considering, I guess, revisiting you know that decision. Um, so one of the things that I, I guess motivated this was a, a leak that was published to Wired magazine a while ago, and basically a map of all the uh, shot spotter locations. And uh, this kind of caught one of the uh, Somerville city councilors attention. Anyway, so the although shot spotter says it works in conjunction with the uh, police departments, um, you know, on placement of and, and that sort of thing, um, you know, what has tended more to be the cases that the 
uh, company keeps the location secret, even from the police and the elected officials who approve them. Um, hence the, you know, the like the surprise of the city councilor mentioned earlier. And, you know, in Somerville, a lot of these have been uh, deployed in sort of like the lower income parts of the, parts of the city. Uh, this sort of isn't unusual. Although ShotSpotter says that, you know, we work with police departments to place them, you know, you kind of don't really don't know where they are. It's, you know, they end up going to, in more low, lower income communities. The other thing that's, you know, sort of been problematic with them, um, you know, sometimes historically ShotSpotters have had difficulty um, telling you know, distinguishing between gunshots and say a uh, an a a uh, a city bus with a bad muffler or just you know loud traffic in general. So um, in Chicago, you know, the Chicago Police Department uh, estimated that something like eighty nine percent of their shot spotter alerts were you know they were dead ends. The police found nothing. Um, the company challenges this. They they say they're ninety seven percent accurate, but you know Chicago was. Um, unhappy with the tech enough that they actually discontinued using it. So that was one of their biggest customers and um, no longer. Now, when these were first deployed in Boston, yeah, they had also had, um, you know, Boston is another shot spot user. user. They've also had uh, issues distinguishing, you know, the sound of gunshots from the sound of uh, loud vehicles. Uh, in Somerville, there were, I think, a total of 16 alerts in 2023. Now, my understanding is that, you know, the city council is talking about this and the mayor has not yet taken a position. Um, one thing I, I did read in the article that I thought was kind of interesting is, um, you know, ShotSpotter works pretty hard to keep the location of their devices secret as well as the appearance. Um, and I guess they're, you know, they want to pursue legal action against whoever made the uh, leak the, the location information to Wired. But the article mentions, you know, that the company typically enters into partnerships with private property owners to, you know, install their de devices. Um, I'm actually kind of curious to see what those. Uh, I'd be curious to see what, um, you know, those those uh, um, those partnership agreements look like. <laughs> uh, they're very secretive. You know, they they say they. Oh, excuse me. They say that, you know, they're trying to, you know, not attract attention and trying to avoid having their devices vandalized. But, um, you know, it's it seems like one of those things where it just ends up being, you know, over policing of, uh, lo econ you know, lower economic areas. And, you know, with I guess you can call some questionable results. Thoughts, gentlemen. I mean, what was it? I, I saw ACLU uh, of Massachusetts uh, said that Boston police records show nearly 70% of shot spotter alerts are dead ends. So that's that strikes me as a very high failure rate. And and that's taking resources away. So if you, you've got a report, oh, there was a shooting over here and you go looking over there for a dead end that's not going to turn up anything then that means you're not dealing with something else there are other calls that you're not dealing with so it seems yeah. like a waste wasted resources even if like the federal government is paying for it yeah and i mean one of the things that shot spotter says is that you know it can be difficult to confirm one of these things. I mean, so let's hypothetically say, you know, someone's, you know, just pulls out a pistol and fires a couple of shots into the air and walks away. And, you know, that's the end of it. Right. Um, you know, there aren't, you know, they don't leave casings on the ground. No one was injured. There's no property damage. I I'd be really surprised if in, you know, Eastern Massachusetts, that sort of thing would be typical, <laughs> um, you know, given, um, you know, Massachusetts has some of the stricter uh, firearms laws in the state and, you know, it's not, 
people don't routinely go go around and just you know fire off a couple of shots well there's also a, a thing where you know the rules and those who are ruling over us those who are making the rules those who are enforcing the rules need to be held to a higher standard um it's just the same as not wanting to have governance over us with people behind closed doors. It's really, and the very secretive nature of it makes it seem like there's something sketchy behind the scenes. Like you said, I'd love to see what one of these contracts with the property owners are. I would love to see the, the it's all this like cloak and dagger stuff, you know? So really a microphone is a microphone so they're listening in on the city of Boston, the city of Chicago, all these different places. What else are they picking up? Mm -hmm. So, you know, of course they want to be secretive. They're probably funded by organizations that probably don't want us paying too much attention to. I'd love to see their books. I'd love to see who's funding them, where the money's going, where the money's coming from, you know, and see who's in bed with these people and why they're protected up on high by the Prince of Darkness. You know what I think shot spotters need? More, um, more claves, cowbells, wood blocks, and other various sorts of handheld percussion. <laughs> oh my God, we need more cowbell. <laughs> well, that's certainly something we could do, organize outings to go and just hit cowbells around, uh, especially once we've gone and identified where they are. So... Uh, one of the things we do at cctv.massparrots.org is map surveillance cameras. And we've had members who have gone and mapped shot spotters they've been able to find. Uh, there's a few in Chelsea. Um, so if that's something that you want to participate in, um, hopefully in April and May, we'll go out in the Somerville area, look for these shot spotters. We know from the Wired report um, what's their general location, um, in, in the sense of they're in a census district, I think is how they organize the data. Um, but we don't know their specific location. So being able to go around, uh, if we, you know, uh, if you've got a drone or you know how to fly drones, uh, that would certainly be useful flying up to look on roofs and see if they're there. Apparently, some of them are on private property. We, we have a member who that happened uh, in the past with them, where he found a shot spotter that was on his roof. And he wasn't aware of it, and which is, I, I think, the, the more interesting part. <laughs> Well, eventually he, he eventually he figured it out when uh, he realized it was tied into his power. So... <laughs> Anyways, um, so one of the things that came out in April 2nd was Indianapolis Police Department um, reviewed three gunshot detection systems and decided that none of them are worth paying for. So, so basically, if the feds don't pay for it, then they're, they're not going to go and go out and get it themselves. So that's something to... Uh, to think about in terms of cutting back, you know, if you don't make it available, if, if you don't subsidize it, then perhaps people won't use it. Um, so Joe, there was another thing that uh, occurred privacy and surveillance wise. Do you want to clue? Yeah. Up? yeah. So section 702. Um, so they don't really need to spend money on, on surveillance sound systems when they can just get all of your information um, and just not even get a warrant and just get your information. Uh, both the Restore the Fourth and the ACLU have covered this pretty extensively and Jamie, I'm sure will give you links to that because Jamie's awesome. Um, but that being said, um, the more recent one being the ACLU article on it. Now this comes for the for Americans that travel outside the U.S., if you're traveling outside the U.S., expect the U.S. government to be staring at you. Um, so all you passport bros, all you passport girls, uh, if you're leaving the U.S., 
Uncle Sam is going to be following you with keen interest. So you best behave. Um, and so they just ratified this. So they don't need a warrant to spy on you. You're no longer fully protected as an American citizen, which is awful because you're still an American citizen. And um, I wonder how far of a jump it is from people who travel outside the U.S. to people who are just staying inside the U.S. I know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, oh, sorry. So, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, although it's ostensibly aimed at um, you know people at surveilling foreign people, um, you know historically a lot of domestic communications have gotten caught up in this. Uh, we know this from the documents that Edward Snowden uh, leaked and were published. And one of the things that sort of surprised me as, uh, you know, I was, you know, eagerly go reading them and, and, and learning about like uh, these, these programs that I had never heard of was that, you know, the federal government has a really novel definition of collect. So by by their ver by their definition, you know, collecting metadata about communications and storing it on a computer system, storing it in some data center, that's not collecting. It's only collecting when they go and look at it. And you know, the idea and apparently the the thresholds for needing to go and look at it are kind of low, I gather. Um, you know, Congress had the opportunity to create a warrant requirement to go searching through this stuff. Now, again, it's, you know, although the government doesn't say they've collected it, they have. <laughs> they've stored it. Um, I, I To me, storing and collecting are pretty much the same thing. But, you know, it was a 212 to 212 vote, I think. You know, it basically, it was a tie. And you know, now we're we're instead of a, at least having a warrant standard, um, you know, we're you know we're back to whatever the sub warrant standard was. I mean, really, the there should be a warrant requirement to store or collect this stuff in the first place. But you know, unfortunately, we're uh, we're a long way from there. I mean, even with a warrant, that standard's so low. When you're talking to Joe the cop like day in and day out he's asking for a warrant typically that's a work relationship how hard is it going to be to be like hey judge jamie i need a warrant and jamie's like do you have good reason and i'm like yeah i do and he's like okay here's your paper um that's not really a hard threshold for you to have you know like probable cause and reason and all these different levels that they need in order to get to search and they're not even bothered to do that yeah like, i mean ah uh, you know there is historically you know the the foreign intelligence surveillance act was that was came out after we adopted that after september 11th right and that is so i mean it's ostensibly being um you know, used originally the goal was to, you know, go after quote unquote foreign terrorists. Um, in reality, it's been more about uh, going after Muslims and black and brown people and activists. And, you know, if you're, I, I think, you know, domestic terrorism and white nationalism <laughs> is actually a much bigger threat, or at least they, they kill people on a more regular basis. So the just to be clear, uh, the Patriot Act was um, was after September 11th. The FISA was first in uh, the 70s, introduced May 18th, 1977. All right, I, I had the two mixed up, and I thank you for for the correction. I mean, there's there's yeah. so many. I mean. Yeah, there's like an executive order, which I'm spacing on. There's the Patriot Act. There's this. Um, I, I, in yeah, other words, I mean, it's it's sorry, it's ahead. a lot of misplaced stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's really misplaced. Well, what it is is the rights of the American people, public being our decency, our right to uh, un uh, right to privacy. Um, 
has been slowly eroded since day one. I mean, they're one of the things where you weren't allowed to have soldiers in your homes. That was part of the Constitution. And so instead of having soldiers in your home, they're just in the background. They're watching you from your own ring. The, you know, I remember when, when we were going around how many rings there were, Jamie. Oh, uh, it, no. it, <laughs> just, oh, not really realizing that, hey, the government's watching us from your own doorbell the whole way, <laughs> like all day long. Yeah, there, there were a lot of ring cameras when we went door to door. It, it depended upon the street. Um, but yeah, it would, like, there were times that it would be like ring, ring, one after the other. Um, I mean, the one thing I want to bring up is there's never been a warrant requirement, as far as I know. And this was an attempt to add one in, and it failed. The amendment failed 212 to 212 when seven of the nine Massachusetts U.S. House members did not vo voted against it. So only uh, Presley and, and McGovern voted for a warrant requirement. Clark, who's generally good on surveillance issues, I don't know. I've heard maybe because she was in leadership, she felt like she couldn't vote against, she couldn't vote for the amendment that said there are Republicans in Republican leadership and they voted in favor of it. So all we needed was one vote and seven of the Massachusetts House members could not do that. So when you think about who you want representing you, realize that on privacy issues, uh, at least seven of the nine don't have your back, which is why you should run as a pirate uh, for U.S. House of Representatives. Um, Partially why I am running. Speaking of, speaking of running, Joe, state rep, tell us, how's it going? Uh, so I was out there, I got another... Uh, 22 raw signatures today. I wasn't able to give it quite the time commitment that I normally do, but you know, you, it, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So right now I have 69 raw signatures to submit. Uh, this last week it was really busy for me. So, um, which is good because money, my kids and I need money more than ever because, you know, we can't balance a budget and our inflation is going through the roof. Um, so, which is again, why I'm running for Congress, because I'm looking to, uh, kind of help put some numbers back in order. Um, but that being said, um, I, I still got out there today and really to me now, it's about going out there at least, uh, every week, if not a couple times a week, just knocking on doors and having conversations and some of those conversations can be pretty awkward. Um, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I am, and I am not accepting donations. I'm doing this on my own. And the whole point to me is to really introduce myself and be like, look, it's just me. You can call me, you can reach out to me. One of the best conversations I had today was with a gentleman. He's like, and we had a disagreement. He ended up signing the papers for me, but we had a disagreement about a public figure and how sometimes public figures, they deal with death threats, they deal with public that are like that. And I told him flat out, look, I know what I'm signing myself up for. If there's a policy that somebody doesn't agree with me, I want to hear it and I want to hear why. I want to know so that I can understand those who I'm representing. I want to... I want to understand them. That is my job. And if I'm to the point where they have feel that the only way that they're going to be heard is that they have to threaten my life, that means I've failed that person. So if somebody needs to reach out to me, that is part of the game. Now, sure, there are some people that are have mental issues. There are some people that have 
uh, all sorts of issues, and that's part of dealing with the public. But for the most part, I I spent many years dealing with the public, and the my biggest thing to me about running is to serve. It's it's my duty to make sure that things are done right. And if no one else seems to want to do it, <coughs> Howard, <coughs> um, you know, and not get out there and not listen to her constituents, then it falls to us to go and put them right. You know, do I want to run forever? Absolutely not. I want to run until I'm replaced. Be replaced by somebody better. And that's kind of how I've been with this whole party and everything from day one, you know? And so I, I really think that each one of us has a duty to go out there and make the world a better place. And, and the best way our leaders can make the world a better place is by listening to their people and what's going wrong and do something about it. So, and hopefully, uh, the message gets across. Even if I don't win this race, hopefully that message gets across. So. Thanks, Joe. And just as a reminder, if you want to help out, um, Joe and myself and whomever is able to come out, uh, we'll go out door knocking next Sunday, the next two Sundays. Uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. That seems like a, that's kind of the sweet spot time, Joe. Yeah, Maybe. that's generally when we get people who are most relaxed. And, you know, I, I got a lot of good conversations in. That's the time where we can generally get people out. Now, I know there's an honorable representative who's a pirate who will be running, I believe, next year or the year after. His name is Mitch. He's a great guy from Chicago. And he's coming out in order to really help us out with the campaign and really learn what it's about. And so I will be getting in contact with him tonight and hopefully we'll get some more people even outside of Massachusetts um, to make sure this happens. Now, if my statistics run true, we're already almost to the point where we have enough signatures to get on the ballot, or if not really close to it. So the next two weeks is just to ensure that we have enough that they can't contest us. So, I mean, in terms of raw signatures, we have, what, close to 300 raw signatures already? Or pretty, I'm sorry, close to 200 raw signatures already. And with a 80, like an 85 to 90% uh, actual success rate in those signatures, uh, we're, we're sitting pretty. Um, but again, it's, we want to make it so that they can't really contest us being on the ballot at all, you know? And then you found that you, you've met other candidates who were gathering signatures at like supermarkets and stuff like that. Yeah. But, um, so they were sending their people. So there's a, a candidate running for Senate from the workers party, um, for state Senate, for, for state Senate. And so um, and more power to them. It's, and they actually knew who we were and, or at least they knew you, Jamie, <laughs> they knew you very, very well. Um, the gentleman also shared your last name, but no relation. Um, and the, uh, and he was out there gathering signatures. Now he was going more of a traditional, like say a supermarket, get signatures that way. The only thing that I don't like about that as opposed to my method, which is door to door is it doesn't They're They're standing there with their groceries. They're either going to the supermarket or they're not. And I like the idea where we're going door to door and we're getting people where they're not as engaged. They can have a conversation with us. They can give us their grievances. They can tell us what, what's what, um, they can tell us no, they can tell us yes, but it gives them that opportunity. Some of the conversations I had with people today was absolutely priceless, and it was their experiences. Uh, this one little old lady, she she had me for like five minutes, but she was an absolute hoot, and I, if I get to represent her, I will be honored. So, you know, it, it gives you that... I think door-to-door, -door, especially with the grassroots movement, is really what 
is really the type of politics or type of politician I want to be. So. Thanks for that update, Joe. So uh, that's it for us now. We're pretty much at time. Uh, so if you want to help out uh, with either producing these, participating, we could really use some help producing these. Uh, then send us an email, info at masspirates.org. As always, you can find us at masspirates.org. And there's a whole YouTube thing. You can choose to do that or not. Uh, but we'll have links in the description for uh, how you can uh, join our mailing list, find us on social media, and all that. So um, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Eli. Thanks, Steve. Um Looking forward to this, hopefully, next week. We'll see. Um, and you, thanks for watching us. Take care, folks. Have a wonderful, wonderful time and a wonderful week. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. But definitely, uh, yes, with those comments, we definitely read those, and it really does help feed the algorithms. Perfect. Thanks so much. Bye.